year we decided that rather than making a long introductory from us, we wanted to give the floor to free users and we wanted to start our relation as about speaking what it means to, to be living in a world where platforms have such an important role from the point of view of users. So uh, we, we open a call for people to share the story with us and with you this morning. Uh, we have free people coming from different backgrounds, from three different parts of the world that are going to share their story. But I would like to, to give them the floor and I will start. Eduardo, would you like to start? And present yourself. Can I sit? Or yes, please okay. sit. Okay. okay, I have my memory helper here, so. Okay, thank you so much for having me. My name is Eduardo Carrillo, and I'm from Paraguay in Latin America. So I'm coming for a 40 degree Celsius to a zero, so I'm a bit cold. <laughs> um, I come from a digital rights organization called TEDIC, which is uh, the only digital rights organization working right now in my country. So we have a lot of things in our hands. We're a group of five amazing people. My coworkers are really uh, committed persons with human rights in the online world. And uh, when we saw this opportunity of Privacy Camp uh, and the user story, I sort of went back in time even a bit before I was a digital rights activist. In fact, I was just a user starting to understand these issues, but still very immersed into digital using of platforms. Um, so my particular story, I, I would like to do a bit of uh, context, maybe first, about where I come from. Uh, Paraguay is a country which is pretty much the periphery of the periphery in Latin America. We're a country that has a lot of problems um, in access to essential services, and it's a very poor country too, as well. But even so, with that context in mind, digital technologies and the internet are indeed reshaping the way uh, society is interacting among one another. Um, so it is important to have a view into these issues and from Global South countries as well. So um, with that in mind, the things or concepts such as privacy or freedom of expression in general life are new concepts. So translating those issues or those rights into the online world, it's quite a challenge in terms of making understand people uh, what does, it, what does that mean? Uh, what are the nuances of that in the online world? And what are your rights in general? So jumping now into my story. Um, my particular experience as a user is, among other things, um, conditioned by different aspects of my personal life, one of them being my sexuality. So as a gay man, I am a regular user of dating apps, one of them being Grindr, which is uh, in Paraguay the most popular gay dating app and al also in the world, uh, as numbers of the company says all, all the time. So to understand a bit Grindr for those who are not using it, this is a platform that shows you nearby people based on the proximity of other Grindr users. So two years ago, I set up a casual meeting with a with a guy, which was in Asuncion as well. Um, he was, yeah, it was two years ago. So we set up an encounter, and after it happened, as normally in this kind of platform encounters, it never goes into something else. It's just a one-time thing, and then it's over. So um, this was a guy that was two, two, to understand a bit about that as well, um, was a guy that didn't have actually absolutely nothing to do with me. He was an older person than I was, so we didn't have friends in common. He didn't work on the same issues as I work on. Pretty much the only thing that we had in common back then was the fact that we both lived in Asuncion. So that was, that's the first thing to remember in terms of my story. And then another thing is that two years ago I was a different person also. So I didn't have quite understanding, or maybe just a bit, about these kind of things that we're talking right now. Um, I was not an out, 
I, I, I wasn't, I didn't came out of the closet yet, so I used the platform in an anonymous ways, which is pretty much the way a lot of, or I'm pretty sure that more than 50% of users in Paraguay uses the platform in an anonymous way. So that is important to, to have in mind as well. And also, um, having in mind the context of me not having nothing in common with this guy, it was to my surprise that three or four, late, three or four days later, I think, um, the guy magically appeared on my Facebook feed as a friend suggestion. So at first I saw, so I saw the face and I remember, well, I know this face. And then it was, I started to, under, to, to think what, what had happened because, well, first, this is not Tinder. And back then, because now it changed, but back then you had to have a Facebook profile in order to set up a, a Tinder account or a Tinder profile. So it couldn't be that. Uh, so I remember that Facebook already bought uh, WhatsApp back then, but since I used the, the platform in an anonymous way, I didn't give my phone number and I didn't register his, of course, into my WhatsApp um, agenda, so it couldn't be a migration of data between those two platforms that are owned by the same company. So I was really confused. I was pretty much not understanding <laughs> what had happened, right? So, you know, sorry, I, I have problems speaking in public. <laughs> so, well, yes, just in order to finish that particular aspect of what I'm talking about right now, it was to my luck, really, that the guy really didn't do anything. So, even though he was appearing into my Facebook feed, and then obviously, most likely, I was appearing into his. So then the anonymity in which we were both uh, established the contact was broken. But he didn't do anything. He didn't add me, or he didn't um, wrote me, or anything like that. So that was a phew for me. But it is, a, it is a problem that sort of stood in my mind. And then after I started working in these issues, uh, I sort of starting to do linkage, lower linkages between vulnerable communities, particularly LGBT ones, and what what are the maybe implications that the using of digital platforms can have in their lives. And Paraguay is a very problematic country because we are very much uh, backwards in terms of human rights for uh, LGBT community in particular. We don't have a law against all forms of discrimination, and taking just that as a starting point, pretty much you can understand the rest of it. We don't have no equality laws, no marriages, or sex name, sex name change laws. So people who are relying into their anonym, anonymity to exercise their reproductive and sexual rights, or just general rights of, of freedom of expression and so on, can be very, very, very negatively um, can have a very negative impact in terms of if these platforms violate their rights to anonymity or to privacy. So uh, part of my work now as an LGBT activist in Paraguay is related to talking to communities about these kind of issues. Because as I was telling, it's, uh, they are still very much indeed problems that are new in the country. Um, and then I would like to maybe do some general reflections about uh, my story, but digital platforms in general as well. So I think that I don't want to put all the blame on Grindr. I mean, they're just part of a much bigger problem right now, which is the way these platforms are used in our data and the ways that they're not necessarily held accountable as they should be. And, but the thing is that Grindr in particular should be, uh, or in other dating platforms as well, should be uh, observed with more attention because they are built specifically for a community that is already worldwide uh, discriminated. So any actions that they have, any policy that they apply, have or can have very much different impacts into the communities that are using those platforms. And the thing is, and maybe a problem that I analyze as a Global South person is that most of the times, the analysis or the politics that they do in regard to their platforms are thought for Global North people who already have 
rights, who already have uh, a much better environment, both online and offline. So when they apply these norms globally, they have different impacts to different people. And of course, those who don't have rights or those who are already vulnerable, not only online, but also physically, uh, of course, suffer it in a different way. So that's something that should definitely be something that we should reflect on in order to in order to start to make these platforms with ourselves, of course, of course, as users, to really create an environment and an internet that is truly safe for everyone, regardless of who they are or what they want to do in the online world. So, um, I, I think I said this in the in the beginning. Uh, I've been doing a lot of talking with LGBT groups about this uh, for a year or so now. And it's very interesting because uh, sometimes they really don't understand the power of, of digital platforms as well, in terms of they just maybe disregard rights as privacy or, well, privacy in particular is problematic because they don't fully also uh, understand it because in other countries and especially in the South, those are rights that are new for people. So not only in digital, in the digital environment, but also in the online world, in the offline world as well. Privacy is not something that uh, worship maybe would be a word that I would use in this particular situation. Uh, so and and talking to LGBT, LGBT groups and particularly activists who are already very empowered into their sexuality, they just tell you, oh, I don't really care if someone knows who I am with or what am I doing? They can just take my phone and take it away. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge that we must start to think uh, in terms of using new vocabularies to engage these audiences that are greatly endangered. And even though they have understanding of those, of those dangers, they don't necessarily fully uh, understand it. So they just discard these kind of uh, conversations. Um, but when you do the exercise of maybe challenging some ideas, it always uh, definitely pays off. But these are communities that are, in most cases, alone. Uh, they don't know how to act when problems like this happens. Uh, in their, not even grinder so but maybe uh, the using of Facebook. Um, so in Paraguay, we don't, have, uh, we don't have a law against, we don't have a law for sex change, for a name, sex cha name change, sorry. <laughs> Um, so we've been doing some work with trans sex workers and they are used to their Facebook accounts being shut down every three or four months because fundamentalist groups uh, report their accounts and, and these are communities that are very used to sharing their bodies uh, into their social media accounts. So once their, uh, their, their profiles are blocked, they don't have any resource to prove that they are in fact the person because Facebook asks them for identity documents that are not uh, given in the country. I mean, the, the, the countries, the, the identity numbers that they have are the ones from their death name, as they tell, tell it. So it's a double violence that they have to suffer. Not only their accounts being shut down, but that the platform itself is not taking into account different contexts that don't have this kind of law, and they ask for documents that are reminding to these people something that they don't identify anymore with and that they don't want to show. So they just reopen an account three or four months or so, which is not also, I would say, a, a, a fair thing for these kind of communities, that they do want to use these kind of platforms in the same way we want to do it as well, not losing all their contacts every four, er, three or four months and, and so on and so on. So, Maybe just as a wrap up uh, to let the other speakers uh, speak as well. I think that the challenges are many, but I do celebrate that more and more people are starting to uh, discuss about these issues. And just to say that uh, everyone has a voice and we should all be speaking from different parts of the world about the worrying, about the things that are worrying to our context and how we perceive also rights such as privacy or freedom of expression in the online world and offline world as well. So thank you so much for listening to me and for this opportunity.
Thank you very much, Eduardo. Um, I would like to invite Anna to share her story with us, too. Hi everyone, I'm Anna Popstefania and I'm gonna show you some things. So I have a presentation. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, my experience with Facebook's um, ad personalization algorithms. But first let me introduce myself. So I'm a party animal. I really like to go a lot. I'm also kind of interested into learning how to code. Uh, I'm a very big Harry Potter fan. I also am very um, concerned about my social persona. I am into smart uh, gadgets and I love ironing. I also work in a huge company, so we need things to organize our work. Uh, I have a cat, yeah. Uh, also, I'm interested into the latest uh, games out there. I also speak very well Dutch, and uh, I am pretty wealthy, so I can afford myself to travel in different parts of the world and also stay at uh, nice hotels. I might have some problems with my stomach, but then who doesn't? And maybe that's why I need a few energy uh, techniques. I also have a kid, yeah. And once again, I'm wealthy enough to be able to invest in things and also travel a lot. Also, something's not wrong, something's not right with my eyes, but oh well. Um, I'm pretty much into activism and social issues. And I, Japan is one of my favorite um, destinations. Because I'm so busy, I need something to just relax, so um, learn some new techniques and probably yoga is the best. Uh, thing for me. Also, I work. I'm also interested in co working spaces because they are something new. And uh, I am very much into winter, skiing, and mountains, and especially uh, island. I might go there with a helicopter, just take uh, some classes, or I might just buy a Nissan and uh, drive myself together with my boyfriend, who I, I'm, I love very much. Well, this will be all great, but unfortunately, none of this is true about me. Apart from the part that I would like to code, learn how to code, and maybe that I'm interested into activism and um, social issues. But nope, I do not speak Dutch. I am not wealthy. I'm a student on a scholarship. I also don't have kids. Yeah, maybe one day. So far as I know, I do not have problems with my digestive uh, tract. Definitely cannot afford uh, Marriott hotels. Uh, I'm not into games. Well, how did I find out all these things about me? Well, part of my academic curiosity and also um, private curiosity, I started a process where I was uh, looking at uh, and recording what kind of ads uh, Facebook has been um, serving me for a period of now two months, for which I gave uh, Facebook full access to track me across websites, apps, um, uh, to upload lists from advertisers, so everything that I will do, I basically uh, wouldn't do, I basically allowed um, uh, Facebook to do. So what am I what am I doing this is because I'm in really interested into the algorithmic identity that mm -hmm. Facebook is uh, assigning to me. I borrowed the definition of algorithmic identity uh, by Kylie Jarrett, uh, in which uh, it says that um, my algorithmic identity is the version of me that Facebook or any other uh, data collecting platform uh, has created about me and it mobilizes it uh, in its personal uh, personalization algorithms. So this uh, algorithmic identity is prescribed intentionality 
also uh, assumes that I have certain interests, certain behaviors, and certain activities that I am willing to take uh, into future. So it has also kind of a, a predictive um, aspect um, to it. And every time uh, I click something, I search something, or do some action, uh, n uh, more chunks of data are uh, just added to, to my algorithmic identity. Uh, but the thing is that um, uh, I want to see how much of overlap is between the algorithmic identity that I've been assigned and my sense of my real identity at this real moment. So by now, all of us here, I assume, know how uh, Facebook is actually building this uh, algorithmic identity of ours and um, like a kind of a database of intentions. And that is by tracking our uh, behavior on its platform its family of apps, and also by tracking us all around the internet, sometimes also um, uh, combining online and offline data from um, uh, different uh, parties. So f during a month and a half, I saw that Facebook track tracked me only on 3.15% of the sites that I've visit visited, but then on the other hand, I have other historical data on me, which says that uh, majority of websites uh, uh, Facebook tracks me on 23rd percent of them. So what did I do? Uh, just a, a quick, um, I recalled all the data that I've been, uh, all the ads that I've been served with all the data, with the advertiser, the message, the call to action, the language, and also I checked reasons why I've been served this ad. But I also used another opportunity uh, that Facebook gives uh, through its ad settings. I checked uh, regularly how the uh, ever-growing list of uh, my interests has been added to uh, my interest um, uh, column. And um, also I recorded all the advertising that they, Facebook says that I've interacted with and the reasons how, uh, and the ways how I interacted with them. So in case you're not familiar, this is how actually, why am I seeing this ad looks like. There are ways uh, I might have visited a website, I might have liked uh, a page, um, I might be interested into another party, but then uh, the advertisers assume that I'm a perfect match for them. Um, I might use someone's app, and this is my favorite, people who are similar to their customers. Why I like this part the most um, is because actually it's the most obscure of all the transparency um, measures that Facebook is uh, taking to tell the, their users why they're seeing a particular thing. So. Uh, the option similar to your users uh, uh, is based on one of the options for advertisers to um, create a lookalike audience, which means that they can, there are other, uh, many ways how to do it. They either combine um, uh, offline uh, records they have of a group of customers, or they gather data from people who've opened their apps or have been using their website. Um, and also, um, this is my favorite, the offline uh, activity, what you are doing, what customers are doing in their business in-store. And um, yeah, why this is uh, interesting for me, because actually does not say anything. And as you will see from uh, the data analysis I did on the set I already have so far, 25% um, of the ads I'm being served is based on I'm similar to someone's customer. And I do not know how in what ways and based on what um, I have been similar uh, to someone. But a bit of step back, when I did an analysis of um, the categories of ads that I've been served, you can see that here once again, I am a very outgoing person and I really like to spend as much possible time out of home uh, as possible. Uh, so events is a category that has been offered to me the most. Uh, with music events, uh, half of the events. I'm also interested into education, which might be true to a part, but it depends on what kind of ed education, and also a bit of um, technology. Another category I'm really interested in is in the e interest uh, based on which I have been um, targeted with particular ads. And uh, it's interesting that um, yeah, this list is pretty weird. Uh, one thing people that know me know about me is that I absolutely detest holiday seasons, especially Christmas seasons. But here I am, I've been targeted with ads because I'm very interested in holiday and Christmas season. 
I'm interested into technology, that's true, but more from an academic aspect. I'm not interested into gadgets, I'm not interested into smart devices, I don't wanna use them. Activism, yeah, okay. So I would say Facebook kind of knows something, but maybe not uh, in depth. I also try to look um, um, to kind of merge the reasons of why I'm seeing an ad with the category of product offered. From this nice visualization, you can see actually that there are 127 categories of products that I've been offered. And the uh, majority of them are just, um, uh, don't repeat uh, more than a uh, few times. But what it's interesting from here is that uh, I've been um, um, served ads relating to events based on uh, mostly my age and location and my interest. Uh, I will need a, a bit of a deeper analysis to see why this is happening, but um, this is interesting uh, way to see uh, uh, how Facebook uh, might think that I will uh, react. This is just um, a bit of a um, close up to see. These are some of the categories. I don't know how well you can see, but okay. I was also interesting to see what kind of action uh, Facebook through its ads of its uh, advertisers would like me to do. And of course, because I've been mostly targeted about events, uh, I should attend the events, but also I should shop now, learn more, or book things, or like page. And what is interesting is that um, uh, Facebook is targeting me uh, equally in three languages, English, French, and uh, Dutch, probably because of the location. But also I've seen ads uh, in Italian, and German languages I do not um, uh, speak. Also what's interesting is also I do started learning Dutch. I am not uh, good in Dutch. Okay, so I was also looking at the interest that Facebook assigns to me through its uh, settings and oh boy, this is a really, really nice list. So it um, divides them by categories, news entertainment, business industry, hobbies, uh, people and more. And as you can see, I'm interested into public speaking. They knew here I am. Um, I'm also interested into manufacturing. Okay, construction, mm, not sure. Uh, National Railway Company of Belgium. I think that they will be happy about this. Um, but I'm also interested into crop and uh, a car called Lotus um, Elan. Not familiar with it, but Facebook knows better. Um, I'm also interested in Ural Mountains, I don't know, and yeah, some um, places where I'm, that I'm not familiar with. And then these people, oh well, Echiran, yes, I've heard about him, but I doubt that I'm really interested into him, also Axel the singer. And my favorite, winter sport and skiing, it cannot be more different than what I am as a person. So. Yeah, but then again, maybe fa Facebook knows better. Uh, I was interested to see why I'm being assigned this interest. Like, they are so different from what I am or regard myself to be. And then I got this uh, analysis that it's because I've been clicking on ads hmm, or liked uh, page pages. One thing about me, I never click ads, especially not now for the... Uh, for my uh, research, because that way I might influence. But the thing is, uh, uh, using uh, another app uh, called Data Selfie, I saw that probably Facebook uh, uh, sees uh, something as being interested in on, uh, if your um, newsfeed is stuck on that uh, particular uh, part of the page, which might only mean that you uh, are not sitting on your desk because you went to get some snacks. And uh, this is the interesting part, interactions with advertisers uh, who use a contact list. And very interesting here is that I don't know half of the advertisers, especially this one's uh, Semal CEO rankings and all the seven companies that they have, I've never heard of. And once I was really, really um, curious about this one, Kickbox, and I even managed to find out that they've been uh, registered as a company like a few days before, but they were not, um, uh, many information, although I really wanted to send them a um, uh, data privacy uh, email. Well, nothing happened. Um, once again, uh, obscurity, how these people have um, my data, which might be uh, email and um, or, or phone or whatnot. 
So, uh, yeah, and this is one of the, yeah, to, to wrap it up on a fun note, these are one of the notes that I've been, uh, notes that I've been writing next to my CSV files while I was gathering the, uh, the data. So you can see how confused and surprised I was sometimes by the things that I was seeing in the data that I've been gathering. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, I'll give the floor to Jean Bernard, who will speak in French, and I will try to roughly translate in English, so be patient with me. Hello, sorry, my, Engli my English is very bad, so I have my translator. So, I'm an ancien coursier uh, Deliveroo, pour qui j'ai effectué 5347 commandes, pas loin de 20 000 km entre avril 2016 et début janvier 2018. Je suis un former rider pour Deliveroo et j'ai fait plus de 5347 orders et pas loin de 20 000 km entre avril 2016 et le début de janvier 2018 aussi pour Deliveroo. Okay. Donc, euh, moi, j'ai commencé comme coursier chez Take It Easy. Euh, le 30 novembre 2015, je cherchais du boulot depuis plusieurs mois et je touchais aucune indemnité. Donc, je n'ai pas vraiment eu le choix. Et c'est la seule boîte qui acceptait de me donner du travail directement sans avoir besoin de CV, euh, alors que je n'avais pas fait de vélo depuis plus de 10 ans dans une ville qui n'aime pas le vélo. I started as a rider uh, with the company Take It Easy on 30 November 2015. I was looking for some job after several months where I was having no um, uh, benefits. Uh, I had no real choice and it was the only place where I can work without uh, uh, having a CV or without having, and even um, despite the fact that I was not really uh, using the bike uh, since 10 years and I was not really biking in a city like Brussels that doesn't like bikes. Donc, chez Take It Easy, je gagnais moins de 1000 euros par mois pour 30 heures euh, par semaine. Et euh, chez, Deliver, chez Deliveroo, je gagnais environ 1500 euros net par mois pour 35 heures de travail par semaine. When I was working with uh, Take It Easy, I was earning around 1000 euros uh, per month for 30 hours per week. And when I moved to Deliveroo, I was at uh, 1500 euros net uh, per month for 35 hours. Euh, en, ensuite, j'ai intégré le collectif des coursiers euh, en novembre 2017, euh, suite à la décision de Deliveroo de rompre la convention qui les liait à la Smart. Cette convention permettait aux coursiers de travailler sous statut salarié avec euh, tous les avantages euh, de ce statut euh, et pour les faire passer, pour faire passer l'ensemble de ces coursiers au statut indépendant en fait. Euh, soi-disant pour répondre à une demande de flexibilité, mais en fait, euh, c'était pour faire passer tout le monde au travail à la commande. I started to engage with the collective of riders in November 2017, and this was following the decision by Deliveroo to stop the convention that was uh, between Deliveroo and this uh, um, company, Smart, uh, and that which give to each rider the possibility to work as a um, uh, labor, so a, a salarié, so you are like an employee, um, with all the advantages that are connected to this kind of status. And uh, they uh, broke this convention in order to move all the riders under the status of independent. Um, the, the reason was, according to Deliveroo, to respond to their request, to the riders' request for more flexibility. But actually, it was rather to um, move everybody that was working for them in order to work by order. So no, no fixed labor, but every time that you do an order, you complete an order, you get some money. 
Euh, donc j'ai aussi été porte-parole du, coll du collectif entre décembre 2017 et avril de 2018. Je suis toujours membre du collectif. I've been the spokesperson of the collective between December 2017 and April 2018, and I'm still the member of the collective. Le 1er février 2018, Deliveroo a également commencé à travailler avec l'agrément loi de Croix, qui correspond à la loi peer-to-peer, -peer et qui a entraîné la quasi-mort du statut indépendant pour, pour les coursiers, alors même qu'il s'était battu pour faire passer tous les coursiers en indépendant. On uh, February the 1st, 2018, Deliveroo has also started to work under um, the um, new legislation, the crew. Uh, it's kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, legislation, and he's going to speak more about that. And uh, this uh, implies the fact that uh, um, uh, the independent status of all riders was bring to a death. Uh. À ce moment-là, en fait, il y a plus de 600 coursiers sous statut SMART qui ont refusé de reprendre le travail le 1er février 2018 euh, lors du passage au statut euh, indépendant. Um, on that day, uh, on the 1st of February 2018, more than 600 riders uh, that had the previous SMART uh, statut uh, decided to refuse uh, starting again working Um, and uh, in order to object against the passage to the independent status. Um, bon, j'ai été aussi en charge des négociations et de la conciliation mise en place par le ministère du travail avec Deliveroo. Et uh, au bout de trois mois de négociations, uh, Deliveroo a proposé d'offrir gratuitement un casque et une lampe à tous les coursiers. I've also been in charge of the negotiation and the conciliation uh, that has been uh, brought together by the Minister of um, uh, Labour um, and that uh, 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 took place together with Deliveroo. After three months of uh, negotiation, the only proposition that Deliveroo advanced has been to uh, offer uh, for free a helmet and a lamp for the bike to each rider. Euh, bon, à la suite de ça, moi j'ai décidé de faire appel à la commission administrative de relations au travail euh, afin qu'il juge si cette situation de travail envisagé relevait du statut de salarié ou d'indépendant. En mars 2018, elle a conclu que cela relevait du euh, travail salarié. Donc cet avis est émis par une commission gratuite que tout citoyen ou entreprise peut, peut, peut saisir. Et il est purement consultatif et non contraignant pour Deliveroo. In February 2018, I've uh, um, uh, contacted the administrative commission for the relation with workers or about work um, in order to ask a judgment about this uh, situation of work and whether this was uh, under the status of a worker, employee or independent. In uh, March 2018, the Commission uh, um, came to the conclusion that uh, this situation was rather a, uh, a situation of employee. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Donc Deliveroo, pour contester cet avis, a décidé d'attaquer l'État belge en justice et moi-même à titre personnel. Um, keep in mind that uh, uh, this... Uh, um, a judgment is not uh, uh, constraining on Deliveroo and is just consultative. And uh, Deliveroo decided to contest this uh, avis, uh, this decision, and so decided to go to court uh, against the Belgian state and uh, himself uh, in, under his personal uh, status. Um, and again, uh, this is just a consultative uh, judgment, the one by the Commission. Euh, bon, bah là, je vais parler euh, des conditions des coursiers, euh, euh, passées et présentes, ce qu'on avait en fait avant et euh, où on en est maintenant. Euh, donc, avant le 1er février 2018, euh, c'était euh, un paiement à l'heure et euh, c'était sous le statut SMART. So, 
Uh, now I'm going to speak a little bit about the condition of the riders, uh, what used to be and what are currently. And uh, before the 1st of February, uh, the payment was by hour and uh, we have a collective condition uh, called as status marked. Euh, rapidement, Smart, donc c'est une, euh, une coopérative qui, euh, qui se charge de salarier euh, les euh, travailleurs autonomes, les freelances, euh, et de leur apporter les meilleures conditions possibles. Euh, voilà, donc. Euh Smart is a cooperative that uh, uh, brings together as a collective uh, people that are working as freelance or independent in order to ensure better working condition. Donc euh, sous statut Smart, c'est un paiement à l'heure. Euh, il y avait 80% des coursiers qui étaient euh, sous ce statut jusqu'au 1er février 2018. Euh, un coursier touchait minimum 9,61 euros net. Enfin, à peu près, euh, plus bonus euh, dans l'heure. Dans mon cas, je gagnais entre 10,50 euros et 11,50 euros net de l'heure. It was a payment by hour. 80% of the riders uh, was part of this uh, collective contract or, or collective agreement up to uh, the 1st of February 2018. Each uh, worker had a minimum salary guarantee of 9 euros 61 more or less uh, per hour plus a bonus. And in this case, for instance, it was around 10 euros 50 or up to 11 euros 50 per hour. Okay. Um, he bénéficiait aussi d'une assurance accident du travail qui correspond à l'assurance à l'assurance salariée, donc uh, une très bonne assurance. Une responsabilité civile. En cas de perte d'emploi, il cotisait au chômage, donc il avait la possibilité d'ouvrir ses droits. Euh, et il avait un statut. Euh, et ce qu'on verra plus tard avec la loi de Croix, euh, ce qui est assez important. Euh, et ça lui permettait d'être affilié à une caisse de sécurité sociale. Among the benefits of uh, being part of this uh, uh, system is that uh, there was uh, um, a series of uh, protection. Uh, for instance, a good insurance for accident uh, happening during uh, working hours, uh, assurance loi, and uh, um, a civil in, uh, responsibility insurance. Also, uh, if you were to lose your job, uh, given that you were um, paying um, Unemployment uh, taxes uh, while you were working, uh, you had the possibility to have some unemployment benefits afterwards. And you third, you had also a different status uh, that uh, opened the, the possibility for being affiliated with the mutualité, so with the kind of uh, health insurance, better ins health insurance. And this is going to change with the new legislation. Euh, et ça avait, ça avait un bénéfice aussi sur les indépendants, donc ceux qui n'étaient pas salariés, qui travaillaient pour Deliveroo, euh, puisqu'eux aussi étaient payés pour la plupart euh, à l'heure, à raison de 11,25 euros de l'heure plus 2,50 euros par commande. And it also had uh, an extra benefit uh, for the people that were not part of this convention but were still working for Deliveroo. They get the same kind of benefits. For instance, they were also paid by hour. Uh, up to 11 euros 25 plus uh, 2.50 euros per order delivered. Donc après le 1er février 2018, on est passé au paiement à la commande et tout le monde indépendant. So after the 1st of February 2018, we moved to a system where we are paid by order and everybody is an independent, a freelance. Ouais. Euh, ou, euh, pardon, sous loi de Croix, euh, donc euh, ça correspondait à 7,25 euros la commande euh, pour l'indépendant à titre principal euh, et 5 euros pour l'étudiant entrepreneur et le loi de Croix. So, in practical terms, uh, once we move to the independent status, uh, in the first period, uh, an uh, independent rider um, was paid uh, 7 euros uh, 25 per order and the student uh, entrepreneur um, or student manager uh, or the people that were registered under the loi de Croix uh, were paid 5 euros per order. Ok, euh, là je vais faire rapidement un... expliquer ce que c'est que la loi de Croix. 
Euh, en fait, c'est une, loi, c'est une loi qui permet de déclarer jusqu'à maintenant 6 100 euros avec un taux d'imposition de maximum 10%. Okay, a short uh, um, background story about the uh, Crow legislation. Um, it's um, a legislation that permits you to declare up to 6,100 euros per year. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, okay, 6,100 uh, euros per year. Mm-hmm. Euh, alors, c'est une loi qui se définit par, par rapport aux échanges peer to peer. J'y reviendrai plus tard. Euh, et donc euh, avec ce faible taux d'imposition il y a très peu de recettes pour l'état et euh, si la personne n'a pas un statut à côté euh je vais, je vais ok um, it's based on this notion of peer to peer exchange so there is a very low um, uh, uh, imposition like uh, the state doesn't get very much money out of your salary but it's supposed to, to apply only for low salaries. Um, donc uh, ici on voit que le paiement uh, se fait en fonction du statut. Uh, ce qui est intéressant, c'est-à-dire que uh, on va regarder combien vous allez gagner, on va vous dire enfin uh, sous quel statut vous êtes, si vous êtes chômeur etc., et vous allez gagner moins que votre voisin. Donc c'est il y a un problème d'égalité déjà. Et, euh, et, et la loi de Croix n'est elle-même pas un statut, c'est-à-dire que la loi de Croix, si on n'est pas salarié, ni indépendant, ni étudiant ou chômeur indemnisé, euh, on n'a pas de statut, on n'a aucune cotisation, on ne peut pas demander de carte d'identité. Euh, imaginez les problèmes que ça peut poser. Um, there are several issues with this uh, legislation. For instance, uh, the, um, you are paid according to your status, uh, but the Crow legislation does not really bring you a status. Uh, for instance, uh, you will have different salaries for people doing exactly the same kind of work. Uh, and among the different problems of this legislation, if I got it right, is the fact that, for instance, you cannot ask an ID card. You you are not really like uh, able to claim any extra benefit out of this legislation. Euh, donc Deliveroo va proposer tout de même une assurance accident euh, du travail euh, mais bien en dessous des minima que, que les coursiers avaient avant. Euh, donc c'est des barèmes très très limités, je vais les donner, euh, c'est par forfait, perte d'un membre 50 000 euros et puis plus rien. Incapacité totale permanente, 50 000 euros et puis plus rien non plus. Et quadra et hémiplégie, si vous avez cette chance d'être quadra ou hémiplégique, vous allez toucher 100 000 euros et puis plus rien. Deliveroo still propose some uh, uh, basic um, um, insurance for accidents uh, during working hours and uh, um, uh, civil responsibilities, but those are below the threshold or that uh, the... Um, Uh, previous legislation uh, was granted to riders. Uh, for instance, um, the threshold are very low. Uh, if you lose a limb, it's 50,000 euros uh, one time and then nothing more. Um, if you are considered to be completely unable to work uh, forever, it's 50,000 euros and then nothing. And if you are quadro or hemiplegic, uh, it's uh, 100,000 euros but nothing else. Euh, donc en fait c'est une assurance forfaitaire mais euh, en gros on envoie nos gamins au massacre en leur faisant croire euh, qu'ils sont très bien couverts et le problème est sans doute ici aussi. Yeah, the problem is that uh, we send uh, youngsters uh, to, to, to work as crazy uh, making them believe that they are very well covered in terms of insurance but it's not really the case. Et là depuis août 2018 c'est le paiement à la distance. Euh, donc ce paiement il s'effectue comme ça, c'est 2 euros pour la récupération de la commande, 1 euro pour la livraison et un montant variable selon la distance. Et donc sur le site de Deliveroo c'est bien indiqué que le tarif minimum évoluera d'une semaine à l'autre. Euh, donc en gros que Deliveroo décidera d'un montant euh, pour une course sans aucune concertation. Ce qui veut dire que pour exactement la même course, un coup un coursier peut tout à fait être beaucoup moins payé la semaine la, euh, peut, peut être pardon beaucoup moins payé euh, 
euh, la semaine qui suit euh, par rapport à la semaine précédente. Euh, et c'est effectivement le cas des de, de, retours que nous avons de la plupart des coursiers. Since uh, August 2018, we are paid by the distance, uh, we do. And uh, this needs some explication because uh, actually it's uh, two years for accepting the order or collecting the order, plus one year for delivering the orders, plus a variable amount based on the distance you have to ride. Um, but uh, uh, the, the trick is the fact that, uh, as it's uh, written in the website, uh, the minimum, um, the basic minimum amount for the distance can change week by week. So the liver, in other words, can decide that uh, um, a ride is less expensive or will cost them less this week than previous week. And uh, this seems to be what uh, uh, is happening according to the feedback of some of the riders. Okay. Euh, donc en fait, en gros, d'une commande de 7,25 euros minimum garantie, on est passé à une commande à 3 euros minimum garantie plus variable décidée par Deliveroo en moins de 6 mois. So what uh, happened in less than 6 months, we moved from a minimum of 7,25 euros per order to 3 euros plus some amount for the distance. And this change has happened in 6 months. Euh, moi, les retours que j'ai personnellement des gros rouleurs, des gros rouleurs, c'est que pour garder une rémunération équi équivalente, ils font des courses de plus en plus longues et travaillent de plus en plus. Euh, donc, un surcroît de fatigue, ce qui n'est pas anodin dans un métier comme celui-ci. The feedback that I personally received from uh, riders that have the same kind of uh, statistics that I used to have is that uh, for keeping the same kind of uh, remuneration, uh, you have to do rides that are very, very long and even longer every uh, time, and that you have to work more and more, uh, which uh, implies a lot of uh, fatigue, especially in a work that is uh, based on, on being very attentive to ride in a town like Brussels. Donc, euh, en cas de contestation ou de revendication, en fait, vous êtes déconnecté et euh, vous n'avez plus de boulot. If you, if you raise an issue or you claim something or you want to renegotiate, you are déconnected and you have no more job. From the app, huh? you're the connector. Yeah. Uh, le principal problème, alors uh, c'est problème rencontré au niveau des coursiers, le principal problème c'est de fédérer les coursiers. Il uh, y a quatre uh, raisons à ça, quatre raisons essentielles, c'est la durée de vie des coursiers, donc sans mauvais jeu de mots, uh, environ deux mois uh, dans ce type uh, de structure. Um, there are some problems and the first problem is to bring together the riders in a federation or in a... Um, in a, like to, to have them working together and uh, the main problem is the fact that uh, uh, the, the length of their life as riders and uh, generally people be a, remain a rider for two months only. Okay. Euh, euh, bon, il bah, y a la précarisation des coursiers. Euh, ceux qui restent en temps ne peuvent pas se permettre de perdre leur travail du jour au lendemain comme je l'expliquais avant. Euh, une fois qu'on a mis euh, un pied dans la précarisation, il est très difficile euh, d'en sortir, euh, donc on rentre dans un cercle, vi dans un cercle vicieux. Le second problème est le feeling de précarisation des riders, c'est-à-dire que, une fois que vous avez déjà expérimenté la précarisation ou que vous êtes dans la précarisation, c'est très difficile de sortir de cette loupe. Ok, et euh, le fait que Deliveroo m'ait attaqué en justice aussi, ça a beaucoup calmé les ardeurs de, de certains. And uh, the decision by Deliveroo to bring him to the court, uh, personally, uh, was a kind of a calming effect on all the riders that were tempted to protest. Et la mise en place d'actions sur la durée sont compliquées parce qu'un coursier qui ne travaille pas, il n'est pas payé. Euh, et euh, donc c'est extrêmement compliqué pour lui de, de rester trop longtemps en manifestation. And the final problem is the fact that it's very difficult to keep a long-term strategy or to keep a strike for longer because when you don't work, you don't get paid. And for people in a precarious situation, it's difficult to assume that risk. Donc, deux problématiques principales posées par ces sociétés, c'est l'utilisation abusive de la loi de Croix qui crée en fait une, une concurrence extrêmement déloyale pour les indépendants. Euh, et cette loi a déjà provoqué l'élimination des indépendants au sein de Deliveroo, puisqu'en avril 2018, il restait plus que 142 indépendants à titre principal contre 1508 travailleurs recrutés sous cette loi. 
And uh, the last two problems are the abuse of this uh, cruel legislation, uh, which already brought a lot of independence to move under the new system and is a system that is not really fit for purpose. Il y a aussi un projet de société derrière. Euh, on sait que Uber et Deliveroo ne sont pas rentables et ne seront jamais rentables dans les conditions actuelles euh, du, du droit du travail. Uh, the second problem concerns the, the, which kind of society project is behind these systems and we know that uh, platforms like Deliveroo or Uber are not uh, uh, money making under normal labor conditions. Euh, pour, pour, les, pour un investisseur, enfin pour les levées de fonds, c'est exactement la même chose que de jouer au casino, d'investir euh, dans Uber et Deliveroo. Ils seront toujours perdants au final. Mais ce n'est pas le but recherché. On se rend compte en fait que ce projet politique euh, euh, et de société, c'est un peu la quintessence de l'ultralibéralisme. C'est casser le droit du travail pour un travail sans contrainte euh, pour l'entreprise et dont toutes les contraintes sont supportées par le travailleur. Donc ça crée une concurrence extrême entre travailleurs, pas de minimum horaire. Euh, un travail à la tâche pour tous et aucune garantie de travail de toute façon. Um, for uh, an investor to, to put money on a company like that is like to play at the casino. You know that you will always at the end of the day lose something. And so probably what we have to focus is on the political project that is behind this kind of system that is a project of neoliberalization that aims to change the rule of a working condition and labor. Ok, et euh, donc... Euh Certains économistes disent que euh, ces sociétés, et j'y crois aussi, euh, ne vivant que par l'apport de capital risque, il est fort à parier que ces modèles euh, vont finir par s'écrouler dans les années à venir, cette forme de bulle spéculative. Euh, la problématique, c'est que ce sont les travailleurs et les restaurants euh, qui payent le prix, comme on l'a vu lors de la faillite, dans, lors de, la faillite de Take It Easy. Euh, donc euh, ça a été quand même des milliers d'indépendants euh, sur le carreau. Euh, et des restaurants sur Bruxelles avec des, des trous euh, de plus de 20 000 euros. Donc Take It Easy leur devait plus de 20 000 euros, imaginez pour un restaurant. Euh... Et, um, several economists think that uh, this kind of uh, economic model will fail and he believes the same. But the real problem is the fact that the workers and the restaurant in this case will pay the price of this failure. For instance, when Take It Easy failed, it left uh, some uh, debts with uh, specific restaurants up to 20,000 euros of uh, things that they have not paid. So it has a cascade effects on, on different other companies. Alors ça, c'est juste pour les... Vraiment la fin. Ouais, <laughs> ça, ça c'est juste pour les travailleurs. Euh, c'est le dernier point et pas des moins. Donc pour euh, les clients, en fait, c'est la récupération de données qui sont une valeur marchande très importante. Euh, ce genre de société récupère quand même une quantité impressionnante de données sur la vie quotidienne des, des usagers et sur leurs euh, leur moyens financiers, etc. Donc, euh, et on ne sait pas ce qu'elle récupère exactement. And uh, finally, uh, there is a problem of data protection because uh, these companies collect a huge amount of data about their user, meaning like the people that order food. And uh, uh, this kind of data concerns their habits and their everyday life, but also their financial conditions. And it's not very clear how much data have collected and how this data will be going. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. And I hope the translation uh, was... Uh, faithful enough. Uh, thank you for your patience. We are slightly in, in a delay, but uh, we will start uh, with the next session directly here. Thank you.